Good day and welcome back to the 40 Audi podcast with your host as always, Mr. Thomas Henley. And today we're going to be talking about something that is very close to my heart. We're going to talk about the positives of autism, the strength of autistic people to push through negatives in life, achieve positive things, adapt our lives to a way that fits us best. Um, and today I am joined by Nathan from the Physio Box, which is a newly set up business that business venture that he's gone for. Uh, we had we basically got in t- contact through someone who I used to train with a lot, um, a guy called Jamie, who is the son of the coach of my Taekwondo club. Um, sort of asking um, for me to get in contact with Nathan. And um, we, we've had a few chats uh, about sort of life as as a podcaster, life as someone online and what you can expect. Um, and along the way, we've been chatting about our experiences as Taekwondo athletes, to which you will know if you have been listening to the podcast for a while. Um, I used to be a Taekwondo athlete. I, I got a Commonwealth gold medal at the Commonwealth Championships. Uh, national gold medals as a as a junior heavyweight um and as a minus 80 kilo, kilogram fighter um so i i've been around and i i've been abroad to do lots of international competitions um so i'm very 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 happy to introduce you today to nathan how are you doing nathan i'm all right man how are you not too bad um i'm feeling uncharacteristically quite refreshed today and um, basically, I, I I was feeling quite low mood last night. Um, and one of the interesting things about being autistic is sometimes that you just, you know that you're not feeling good, but it's really hard to connect the reasons why. Like, you, you can feel a certain emotion and then you sort of, you look back at your day and your week and think, hey, what, is there anything during these these days that could be contributing to this? Or is it just my brain or is Mm. there some kind of lifestyle changes that happen and i think i was just tired yesterday (laughs) to be honest sometimes it's the simplest answer um but i had a very good sleep and i slept very long and woke up in midday and you know feeling very chilled so it's amazing what a good night's sleep does for you doesn't it yeah yeah definitely would you like to um sort of tell everyone a little bit about yourself um, before we kick into um, sort of your, your improvement journey and have a have a chat about perhaps um, some of the things that have helped you with your your ventures in life. Yeah, I mean, um, I currently work as a physiotherapist. Um, I'm a, technically a physio and I've done a master's degree in strength and conditioning as well. So I kind of combine those two areas um i work in private practice i've got my own private practice in just on the outskirts of manchester and i work um as like a contractor for different sporting organizations so i worked a little bit for gb taekwondo with usa nice. taekwondo i've worked in rugby league i've worked in football um i've even worked in the nhs i've done everything really um uh, which has all kind of brought me to this point that i'm at now Mm-hmm. Um, well, so, yeah. obviously, this is like you know the forty forty podcast. It's an, it's autism focused, mental health focused. Um, when 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 did you sort of become introduced to the to the idea of of autism and, and ADHD, and what kind of um, spurred you on to get sort of go for a diagnosis and go for sort of discovery journey around it? Yeah, so a bit of an interesting story around it. It was when COVID had just started. I was working at um, Ashworth, Ashworth High Security Mental Health um, Hospital in Liverpool. Oh, wow. Yeah, so it's a very, it's a very uh, different environment. But I remember a manager I had at the time, she just turned to me one day and she's like, she said, you, you know, you're, you're, you're a good clinician, she said, but you're, you're a little bit different. And I was like... Yes, that's correct. Um, <laughs> and my son had already been diagnosed and I told her and she's like, 
just come and have a conversation with somebody. So anyway, one thing led to another. Uh, and I was diagnosed with autism when I was like 36, something like that. Mm-hmm. But I mean, when I got a formal diagnosis, I wasn't really shocked because I guess it's common to all people with neurodiversity. You always kind of know. Um, and she told me, and then ADHD, it was one, it was one of my patients. He was a consultant psychiatrist who also used to work at Ashworth. And yeah. uh, I was treating him one day and he just kind of turned around to me and he's like, you know, you've got ADHD, don't you? And I was like, yeah, I know. And he said, why don't you come for an assessment? <laughs> so I went for an assessment and then I got diagnosed with that as well. So, and I think, I, I know I actually said to him, I said, one thing that confuses me is I don't know where autism starts and finishes or ADHD starts and finishes. And yeah. he said to me, do you need to? He says, I, I, I don't. He said, I just call it neurodiversity. And people have different mixes and, uh, and combinations of different traits and mm-hmm. attributes. He said, you're an individual, as most people with neurodiversity are. And he, he is a consultant psychiatrist who, he actually runs a private company in Manchester called Sanctum Health. And they do uh, private assessments for people that want to go down that route. Um, sure, sure. I think that's it's quite a common um, sort of feeling, especially for, for people who have like a, a dual diagnosis call them odd hds yeah so a a u yeah dhd um and uh i i find it really interesting whenever i've i've talked to to anyone with with that sort of dual diagnosis because it's it it they can be very co- contrary in their like signs um of each so like mm-hmm. with adhd you have the aspect of sort of chasing that that sort of novelty and excitement and interest and quite often that sometimes leads to being quite impulsive and wanting to to make changes and wanting to continuously kind of adjust things but then you've got like the the autism side which is you know thrives in terms of mental health when we have like a stable routine we know what we're going to be doing each day each week um to some degree so it's like at what at what point are you more autistic or ADHD? Kind of, you know that that sort of push and pull kind of dynamic. It's 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 really quite complex. I think. I don't know what your experience was though, Tom, but I definitely felt like I'm more autistic than ADHD. So mm-hmm. if if you you know you read through the diagnostic criteria, if you look at the DSM five, you can see those common traits. There's definitely some ADHD there, but I definitely felt like I'm more autistic, and by virtue of that fact. It was the benefits that came with autism that allowed me to um, attain the level I have in different areas, that um, Mm. attention to detail and being able to consume, you know, like large amounts of information and get that deeper level of learning on a subject area. It was that autistic, those autistic traits that allowed me to excel, I feel, anyway. Mm -hmm. I think it's... um... It's 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 hard, isn't it? Because I mean, obviously, I, I and and many other people, when we do our advocacy work, when we talk about experiences in generality, it's you know, it's the the thing is, is that you can't you can't uh, know exactly how each individual is and how they think and how they live their lives, and everyone has their own sort of personal experiences. Um, I had a podcast with um, Dr. Megan Neff, which I brought up quite a few times just because it was such an insightful podcast for me. Um, but she, she was talking about um, neurodivergent insights, if you want to look her up. But she was talking about the um, being ADHD or autism dominant in terms of sort of presentation. And I, I think for, for a lot of people, some some people might be put off by um sort of i guess put putting levels of autism and adhd kind of as a as a comparison but i think it, it is quite useful in terms of understanding how you live your life how you work because as i said like it's not you know autism is and adhd are the, the psychological diagnosis is so they're they're based on um outward signs and it it's not always clear exactly you know from the scientific literature that there's these 
designated split categories and like biological markers for knowing if someone's autistic or ADHD because we we don't have that because it's not based on on that. Um, it's just you know we we do st some people do studies they look into the trends the biological trends for someone with that diagnosis but it's always from um that sort of psychological basis so it's i really enjoyed that podcast i know the one you said you're talking about yeah. i watched it she it was mm -hmm. really good um what i can say is that having worked with a lot of consultant psychiatrists is that um when you're looking at human behavior you're talking about shades of gray and there is nothing that's clear yeah. cut Mm -hmm. But in order to um, objectify what they do, they had to have diagnostic criteria in order to be able to diagnose somebody with something. Yeah. So in the ICD-10 or the DSM-5, if you look at it, it will have these traits. But I remember one thing that somebody said to me. He said, uh, all these things are, are labels. And when yeah. you strip the labels back, you're just looking at behaviors, traits, you know, common patterns mm -hmm. um and really when you give somebody that diagnosis you're describing um a certain set of psychological um like the psychodynamics that underpins it and that goes yeah. for a lot of mental health conditions the label is probably less important it's understanding the behaviors and why they do them that is more important one for the clinician and two for the individual so they know how best to manage the world that we live in yeah yeah definitely I think I think that another sort of gray area comes in when we when we think about um the idea of sort of identity as well because you know the medical system as as you said it's 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 set up to box you into different categories to label you um and to provide systems of support or ways of improving on yourself that are applicable to that to that label um but when, when it comes to like things like identity um you know it's it's something that's sort of very intrinsic for a lot of people um and it's it's not always the case that every person who has who could be considered to be autistic and adhd um are able or want to go for a diagnosis because it's always based on that sort of model of what's wrong and how can we help and if you don't see anything wrong um they're not going to really see the the point in giving you a label and sort of helping you out unless it's to do with sort of uh validation of your like self-identity which is so it's, it's an interesting sort of area mm. um and just just thinking just as a you know to push things along a bit i mean um you mentioned to me that that you used to um be quite you know into into taekwondo you used to be quite a professional taekwondo athlete mm -hmm. could you talk about your experiences with that um and how that has sort of inspired uh, your current work at uh, the physio box yeah i mean anything like I, uh, any answer i give you today it's just based on my personal experience and i think sure. as a first off it's just um it's my truth, but it doesn't have to be anybody else's truth. And then for anybody listening, I encourage them to find their own path and what works for them. Um, mm -hmm. But with regards to my Taekwondo, um, I did it since I was five. Um, my dad. Wow. Oh, you're one of those people. Uh, <laughs> I started when I was 14. So I, I had a lot of headway to, to catch up with when I started. <laughs> yeah. Um, I mean, in some respects, starting later on is, is better because, you know, you, you know, you develop in other areas, but I was, um, in retrospect, when I look back on things, I had ADHD when I was a kid and Taekwondo, um, was a way for me to kind of blow off steam and get that dopamine boost that, you know, so many of us are chasing. Mm -hmm. Um, so I did it since I was five. And I think that, um, one thing that we face a lot as neurodiverse people is a lot of rejection um, and a lot of being ostracized. Yeah. And martial arts uh, was kind of the place where I found, you know, kind of acceptance um, and I found my special interest. And that special interest has very much followed me right through my life into adulthood. Um, so I did Taekwondo, like I say, since a young age. And then... <clears throat> the funding from UK sports started to come through and it started to become more structured and organized in this country. 
Um, so the first cohort was at Loughborough back in those days at Loughborough University. I wasn't the first, I was the second cohort. Mm-hmm. Um, and that was good because, you know, it gives you all the sort of support services. It gives you financial support and all you need to focus on is just training and getting better. Um, so although, you know, I was working, you know, I was doing my special interest, which was martial arts, when I look back, um, although, you know, I was technically, I told I was technically good, especially for a heavyweight, I used to get massive anxiety, like when I used to compete. Um, and now when I look Never back, late. I know, I know that was autism and ADHD. I know, I know what it was, but at the time I couldn't, um, I couldn't conceptualize it. I couldn't put a label on why I was feeling the way I was. I think, I think as well, just with any sort of martial art culture, obviously it's very different sort of coach to coach, um, club to club. But I think that, you know, that there is a very strong highlight on, on things like stoicism. And sometimes I think that sort of push through it and, you know, accept it and sort of deal with it kind of attitude um, sometimes can be quite hard for us because our experiences of the world, our experiences of competition and training are so much different. You know, um, one person might say, hey, look, you just have to worry about the fight. Um, And, you know, obviously people get anxiety around it. It's a lot of pressure, especially in a point scoring sport. Um, But they they don't experience the fact that you've been in the venue for hours and hours and you've had this sort of heightened sensory experience of being around loads of people um you know sort of those strange interactions with with other athletes when you when you're trying to kind of um establish yourself as a strong person um you know the noise the the floodlights that you get with sports halls the echoes um the smells even of the the headgears and the body armor, the the feeling of having a gum shield in your mouth. Um, there's so many things that we have to deal with. And and especially if you are, you know, like yourself, like quite a an established athlete and you're a man and you, you know, you've got that kind of stereotypical lens of what men should be like. Yeah. If you go and say, Oh, that I'm struggling with the lights, they'll be like, Oh, suck it up. Like you're about to go in for a fight. Um, so, you know, for, for me, sort of going through my own journey, I think as, as I got older and, and older, sort of within the sport, I started to realize that, no, actually, I don't need to deal with this environment. And I started a lot more to spend most of my time out of the competition halls. Uh, whereas before I felt, I felt sort of, um, what was it? I, fe- I felt so bad about not being in in the competition halls and sort of cheering people on and sort of being a part of the whole experience and um but i i kind of needed to have that sort of quiet space you know i think of people like you know one of the sort of a big inspirations for me sort of taking a bit more of the reins of my own sort of mental wellness during the competition was was thinking about people like mike tyson you know like very strong strong guy obviously str- suffered massively with anxiety before the fights you know you just watch documentaries of him and stuff and he did he did have that kind of emotional support he did get himself out of that that space and sort of have quite a time to kind of focus on himself and you know i think that that sort of absolute beast of a person being you know subject to to the experiences that i was having it kind of validated that you know you you know despite everyone saying that fighters are just immune to all fear and um hardships that actually you know we're not we're we're, we're humans and you you do need to think about your sort of mental health especially when you're going into were you tired afterwards i remember i used to compete because neuro you know neurologically and it like um, it was such a it was such a taxing process on like your adrenal system. I used to sleep for like two days because I was just yeah. like so worn out. And it wasn't that it wasn't that you were physically tired. It's the whole process of it, you know, yeah. being there, engaging with people. But as I got older and more experienced, I just began to switch off to it, 
which yeah. then brought its own challenge because I think to a certain extent you need that um, you need that arousal because it keeps you sharp, it keeps you competitive. Yeah. And then when I began to switch off to it, it wasn't there, and I, I didn't enjoy it the same. And I was like, oh, I don't know why, you know, I'm really doing this anymore. And I think by um, the time I was 24 or 25, I'd finished the taekwondo. I came back a couple of times. I won the the nationals like five nice. years later when I was 29. Nice. But um, I think that yeah, I think one thing that's really key is that. Work, being a full-time athlete in a, in a centralized system, you're told, you know, you're going to train at this time, you're going to do this, you're going to do this. It yeah. never really worked for me. And no. when I, when I, because I've always enjoyed sort of learning and being autonomous and doing my own thing, when I stepped away and I, I left the program, I was much happier and mm. I won a lot more medals um, and I was just, um, I did much better when I did things on my own terms, when I was autonomous. Yeah. yeah. I trained when I wanted, I got up when I wanted, I went to uni when I wanted. And that sort of um, independence and autonomy suited me a lot better than being in a full-time program. Um, I was yeah. pretty miserable when I was like in the program. But it, it, for some people, it really works, that structure. Um, mm. I think for neurodiverse, and, you know, neurodiverse people, um, having control over what we do, I think it's more important and it leads to a lot more happiness and fulfillment in my view. Mm. I think that 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 really kind of sets us up for the sort of the tone of the podcast. I mean, you know, I think a lot of autistic people I think we 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 put a lot of pressure on ourselves because you know, we I think I think especially sort of during teenagehood during those kind of early adulthood years um we we can develop a lot of issues with self-esteem and I, I know that from looking back on my experiences I was you know people didn't really sort of pay attention to me at school people didn't take me very seriously um, as a person um, just because of these these flaws that I had in terms of dealing with the the stress and anxiety and overload of school um, but taekwondo was was kind of my route out of that because I didn't I didn't need to talk to anyone or convince anyone that I was like you know a, a person worthy of being friends with or a person like that is skilled or good and you know things like that because I I had that at Taekwondo like people knew who I was because of my fights and they knew that I was hard working because of, they watched me train um so that that kind of I think it just kind of le leveled the playing field for me because it wasn't so based on those social aspects. Um, it was more based on kind of your character and like um, how you deal with losses and how you how you deal when you win and and you know the other person's feeling quite sort of down about losing. Um, I think though those situations where you can really sort of shine through what you're about. Um, in combat sports have been really helpful for me. I think it, it's really important what you said there because um, we live in a neurotypical world and mm -hmm. whether you advance or not to a certain extent or to a large extent is dependent on how well you conform to societal norms, how well yeah. you fit in and how much you're accepted by your peer group. Yeah. Combat sport is it's individualistic. It's a it's a it's an individual endeavor, um, and I think that by virtue of that fact, it's quite merit based. Whether you're successful or not purely depends on how good you are uh, as, as a yeah. athlete or a fighter. Yeah. So it suits us because we yeah. don't have to achieve anything external. We just have to be the best we can be at that sport. So yes. that's why it suits people like us, and um, yeah, it was. It's it's really key that you say that because I think it's a common experience to a lot of people with autism or ADHD. Um, you know, we like to just rely on ourselves because we're in yeah. control of that. You're in control of you and what you do. So um, I definitely relate to that. So um. Where, where did where does the the physio box come in? Because, um, 
you know, I I know that you you mentioned about sort of the qualifications and, and the experiences that you picked up across the way, but in terms of like the future, what do you want the the physio box to be about? Well, I think it all started back. I think you know, ta- taekwondo and being involved in combat sport has kind of given me everything, really, absolutely everything, yeah. because uh, from getting into physio. Um, you know, to meeting, you know, my, uh, you know, my son's mom, I met her through doing martial arts. Mm. So it's given me a lot. Um, but I think it started really when I was um, an athlete because I got injured at a really early age. I did my ACL when I was like 19. And oh um, yeah, uh, but I had a physio, um, Phil, Phil Waterworth. And he was, uh, he was, he was straight, but he was very reassuring and he was calm. And I think uh, he made an impact on me as a person. And I began to think, you know, maybe I could do a bit of that. Maybe that could be something I could pursue. Um, and I think those experiences all support what I do now, whether it's in sports medicine or, uh, you know, working as like um, an entrepreneur with my own little thing. Um, they've all kind of contributed towards getting me to the point where I am now. Um, and the physio box, you know, I've, I've done this in many different sort of incarnations and ways. Like I've had commercial clinics, I've had people working with me, but, you know, I've set up like kind of in my house now and um, it allows me to do it in the way that I want to. It gives you um, autonomy over what you do. Um, and that definitely works for me. So moving forward, I'd like to continue to develop this Um and then I work with a whole, you know, quite a few different sporting teams as well. So I work with USA Taekwondo. I work with a few rugby clubs. Um, I'm hoping to work with some other combat sports as well. So I think that what's important for, you know, autistic people or people with ADHD is that whatever you decide to pursue, it should mirror your passions and your interests. Yes. Because... Yeah. If you have a natural enthusiasm for your subject area, I think success and money will follow. It yeah. follows naturally. Um, it's it's not the same sort of life path, is it? Because it's kind of, you know, just, for, just from my experiences talking to people in adulthood that I used to go to school with, um, the the majority of people that I that I came across, you know, they they were always focused on like the moment. They were always focused on school and making friends and having a good time um none of them really had like something so strong like 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 what i had with taekwondo like this this sort of this passion this kind of um dream i think i think it it is in part due to my negative experiences in school but you know um whenever whenever i started something um you know obviously i was bad at it and over time, I sort of built up my skills and experiences with it. And I think that that journey from um, not being very good at it and being in a bad place and knowing that putting the work in and doing the stuff, even though it doesn't sort of give you that instant reward, it's more that like delayed gratification. Um, it really taught me that, hey, actually, you know, although I may feel weak down depressed you know socially inept in this moment why why can i not work on that stuff why can i not work on the stuff that i did do with taekwondo i could i could learn how to communicate with people better if i wanted to i could understand people better if i wanted to and you know that 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 sort of um you know fact in my head that was like oh my god like i've made it to you know, the nationals and I've got medals and I've gone abroad and I've fought, why can't I do anything else? It's like, it's just so much of a, a confidence boost, especially when you just feel so, um, put down by society and sort of boxed into this sort of protected group where, you know, a lot of people are thinking that you won't achieve anything because of that. Um, I think, I think that sort of early experience of me um, succeeding and and showing the the importance of, of of growing myself and working on myself that was so massively important for all of the endeavors that I've 
taken forward to in the future, even if it's not Taekwondo. Do you feel like your experiences with Taekwondo gave you a resilience that allowed you to address more challenging things like, you know, um, the social challenges that we face? I think, I think to a certain extent, um, you know, when I was younger, I, I dealt with a lot of quite severe mental health conditions and I, I honestly didn't think that I would, um, still be alive past 20. Um, I pretty much had in my head that I was going to go out with a bang and it was just going to be this whole thing. And then it was, I'm at, you know, everything was going to be over and it's going to be, it's going to be okay for me. And I don't have to experience all of this anymore, but, um, I, th- I think, you know, learning that, that resilience kind of motivated me into being like, you know, I do feel like this and. I do win these competitions and I don't really feel much from, from winning them. Mm -hmm. But, um, I think for me, for a common thread throughout all of my life is that I've had some kind of greater intrinsic motivation, um, to it. Like whether I wanted to teach people about my bad experiences, whether I wanted to show people how I did well, um, where I wanted to help people. I always had some sort of goal in my head that kind of pulled me through whether I was happy, whether I was um, depressed, whether I was anxious. Um, I always had that sort of thread that went through my life that sort of inspired me to, I guess, just just try um, and see what happens and see if it does work. I um I don't know if you can see it behind me there, but there's a little sign just above the physio box, and um it's Greek. It's it's uh, it says Temetnosk. So people ask me, oh, what does it mean? Um, and it's just it's a, it was from um one of the um, temples at Apollo in Greece, and what mm-hmm. it means is know thyself. And yes. for me, it's foundational, especially for neurodiverse people, because. We live in a neurotypical world with all these different influences trying to tell you who you are. But I always say to people, you have to know who you are. You have to know who you are and what you stand for. Or who you should be. Yeah, yeah, because I think when you've got a strong sense of that, it makes you resilient and it makes you, um, you don't need external validation. So people always say to me, you know, would you, would you trade your autism you could get rid of it and i'm like no because all the difficulties that i faced because of it helped me develop into who i am who i am so for example you touched on it when we're younger we face a lot of rejection and i was probably a little bit weird when i was younger um so it is good yeah what i did when i had my uh assessment the, the lady that did it she said to me it's remarkable because I've never seen it before. She said, you present like a female would. You mask so well. She said, we couldn't even tell. So by because we, you know, because I was kind of ostracized a lot when I was younger, what I did was I learned to mask extremely well so I'd fit in and not be rejected. So because of that, I I feel like um, I'm able to communicate and build rapport with people really well which I use every day in my job, you know, clinically, you do have to know what you're talking about, but really people buy into you as a person. And if you can't communicate and get them on board, they're not going to listen to what you say. So because of my autism and because of those challenges, I adapted and it was really just a survival mechanism. And then as you've described through that process of, you know, maturation, you get to the point where, you really don't care whether you fit in it or not. You don't yes. need validation anyway. So that's the point that you're at now. Um, and what you do, you know, you know, doing podcasts and getting up there and putting content out like we talked about before before we, we did this podcast, you, you're making yourself extremely vulnerable. And I think yeah. you have to have a strength of character and resilience to do what you do. Um, and I think, you know, you can, you can be proud of that. I, I believe anyway. Mm-hmm. We're not defective. We're just different. And the analogy I always use is that, you know, we run on Mac and everyone else is running on Windows. It's no better or worse. It's just different. And because of that, 
we have um, we're better suited to certain things. Um, we have I, I usually find that you know people who who have you know um, neurodivergent people we have a very unequal skill set. There's things yes. that were terrible. Spiky at. profile. Exactly. Yeah. I can't do admin. And I've got no desire to do it either. I I, I relate to you on that one. <laughs> I've got I've got no desire to do it, but I can build rapport with people. I can get them on side, and I can work with them in a way that enhances their life. Job done mm. for me. Mm. I'm happy with that. So I think um, it's noticing your strengths and noticing your weaknesses. I I think a common a common narrative I always hear is that oh yeah you should work on your weaknesses. I personally think it's, that's a load of rubbish and it doesn't apply to us because it's your strengths that will help you stand out. Go with those. Go with what you're good at um, because that's what will help you develop as a person and become successful, mm-hmm. in my opinion. Definitely. Well, um, I guess, you know, in, in line with the, the topic of the podcast, why do you think that sort of a positive or, or growth kind of mindset is in, important for us? I think because, like I say, because I think we face a lot of social rejection and, it, you know, and it typically is a social deficit, I think we can end up with a lot of anxiety, depression and poor mental health. People with ADHD and autism who are comorbid with, you know, depressive-like symptoms and are often treated for depression when really the depression is just a symptom of being rejected socially because of their yeah. autism. Mm-hmm. Um, I think having a strong sense of identity, like I said, who you are, what you stand for is key. It's absolutely yeah. key. And I think once you have that, you can we, we're able to lean fully into who we are and not feeling like, like I say, you know, we live in a neurotypical world and trying to conform to that's like trying to fit a square peg in a round hole. It just doesn't work. Mm-hmm. Um, so we're able to like, you know, really embrace who we are um, and go with those strengths because, you know, as they say, you, you know, you shouldn't judge a fish by its ability to climb a tree. Yeah, well, yeah. there's certain trees we can't climb. Like uh, my son, for example, he's, he's terrible at maths. Like he, he, it's like it really stresses him out. And I'm like, you know, Relate the conversations again. I've had. <laughs> yeah, as long as he can do the basics. But, uh, you know, he could probably take apart a computer and put it back together again. I personally think his skill with IT is amazing. Why don't we focus on that? So I think yeah. knowing who you are is really important for autistic people and embracing it. Yeah. I, th- I think another another aspect of it, you know, sort of more along the lines of a growth mindset is that, I, I mean, I do see that in a lot of people that they kind of, you know, they feel stuck, um, you know, within, within my my work you know I, I interact with a lot of sort of young people who are uh, sort of have different sort of educational special educational needs um i also talk to a lot of, lot of autistic people of adults within the community and it a lot of them either you know they feel like there's there's no way forward um but the i think there's there's also a, a section of people which you know you could apply to to anyone um because we are as a society becoming so um, accepting and inclusive, um, sometimes we don't put enough priority on growing as a person. You know, you just say, hey, this is how I am and this is how I always be. Um, whereas for, for me, I've always had the, the mindset of, right, this is how I am. Do I want to be like this all my, all my life as the, is there any way that I would want to change myself in a, in a better way? And, you know, obviously the, the merit of that change is, is very dependent. You know, you could say, well, I want to be better, better with girls. Um, so I'm, I'm going to get loads of dates and stuff like that. I'm going to do everything to, um, make sure that I can get to that point. Is it, you know, that's not always the best outcome for you as a person, um, just because of those kind of desires that you have. Um, it, but I, I think it's also, it's, it's a balance, isn't it? Because there are some, um, core characteristics to yourself, um, sort of based from your genetics and experience that, um, are really kind of just neutral and, you know, depending on the environment that you in, that you're in, 
um, they can be seen as negative or positive. Um, but the, at the same time, you know, I, I, f I feel like it's, it's always important to, to be self-reflective in that sense, because there is a lot that you can change about yourself. If you, you know, if you feel like your internal world, your internal values, your character as a person is kind of suppressed from becoming realized uh, for a long part of your life it's going to be it's going to be hard to really realize that and it's it's important to to know that you can do that you can act in in a way over time make new habits that that put you in a place where you are that person that you feel inside um and i i, I see with some people that they just they have that idealized person inside and what they do is they fake it and they put on a facade and they don't actually make those changes, those um, small changes over a long period of time that will lead them to become fully realized as a human being because they, they, they have this kind of cognitive dissonance where they, they think they're this person. So they display these, the, these, these ideals, but they're not that person. Um, and they, they, they probably do, you know, everyone does, even despite what age you are, there's always things that you can work on. There's always mm -hmm. things that, you know, would make you, uh, um, a better person in your, in your own eyes. Um, and I, I think sometimes because we are so accepting, um, of, People as they are, we have this kind of culture as I am who I am. And if you don't like it, you can screw off. Um, you know, sometimes you might be right. And sometimes people might be assholes and be giving you really bad advice. But yeah. it's always worth sort of hearing people out, especially if they have positive intentions with it. Um, so it's, it's finding that balance, isn't it? Because you don't want to be yeah. so narcissistic that you think you're something that you're not and you present yeah. yourself as something that you're not. And so it'll be delusional in that way. But at the same time, you don't want to put yourself down so much that you're not this person that um, you feel like you're always inadequate. Yeah. Um, and I, I like to think of it as a journey because I'm not at the place where I want to be now. But the fact that I'm on my way to be someone that I want to be and I can see those changes over the long, long term yeah it, it inspires me a lot and it ke it keeps me sort of positive and sort of um you know satisfied that i'm able to have control over my life and who i want to be yeah um i really like carl Jung. um like i've read a lot of his stuff and he mm -hmm. he describes the process that you're talking about as the individuation process and i think Sometimes as uh, neurodiverse people, we have so many negative experiences throughout the course of our life. There's these layers of trauma that build up. Yeah. So we end up becoming this person that's so far away removed from who our, you know, our authentic self is, is that we end up living almost a lie. Yeah. Um, and I think the only way that you can individuate or really become you know the best version of yourself if you want is by stepping out of your comfort zone sometimes we retreat into what's comfortable don't we because we don't want to face or we don't want to experience any sort of emotional um, uh, hurt or any um, discomfort but like you say that period that process of growth involves stepping out and trying new things because Otherwise, you live kind of a bit of a socially isolated life, don't you? Mm. And that can't be fulfilling on any level, whether you're neurodiverse or not. Um, yeah. I, I, I mean, I, 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 sorry. No, go on, you go. I was going to give the, the the example of, you know, how I was when I was younger. Because I, you know, I, I, as, as you said, I, I kind of built myself up in taekwondo. <laughs> I built myself up in, in education. And I kind of, I had this feeling that people should be wanting to like me and it just wasn't something that um happened you know like people didn't come up to me and say oh that's really cool and you know got involved i actually had to to have the agency to interact with people and talk to them and and communicate um i think 
you know, up until that point, I thought that if I achieved certain things, that things would just be handed to me. And I was very sort of, um, I guess, resentful. Um, you know, a lot of the experiences that I had with younger, they were mostly negative. Um, people sort of viewed me in a negative light. I, you know, I internalized that and I kind of wanted to fight against that. Um, and through a lot of sort of inter internal thinking, sort of, you know, looking at myself, how I am, how I act, I kind of picked up that, you know, actually I'm probably just being a bit narcissistic in that way. Like why, why should they, what am I, what am I doing for them? Like, just because I'm good at these certain things, does that mean that I'm deserving of everyone's time? And so I was, I was, I was thinking about that and I was like, you know, Hey, look, like Tom, do you, re do you really need to have that, that approach to people? And if, if people don't give you that, do you, do you push them aside? Do you dismiss them? Or do you actually just, you know, have a look and actually just communicate with them and, and talk to them and see if you I get think, on? So. I think, it, and I actually discussed this with somebody I used to work with because where I used to work in, um, in high security mental health, you were dealing with what a lot of you call PDs, which are personality disorders. So they are clinically unwell, but there's not like, um, uh, there's not a, a psychiatric problem. They have what's called a personality disorder. So yes, yeah. um, I think sometimes autistic people can come over with a certain degree of haughtiness. Yeah. But I remember my colleague said to me, so um, in the DSM-5 narcissistic personality disorder, it's a, it's a clinical uh, diagnosis that you can get. He said, but when you take, when you strip the label off it, what is it really? It's just somebody that was wounded as a child and never mm. developed a, a healthy amount of um, sort of uh, self-love. Yeah. So then they develop this almost persona that's really just to defend them from further hurt. That's all it yeah. is. Mm. So um, it's understandable that because I think when we are younger, we go through a lot of traumatic experiences and you do, I've seen it in many people that I've known, they can develop this haughtiness about them, which comes over as arrogance and conceit. And really, they probably just went through a few challenging situations as a child and they never fully recovered from it. Yeah. You know, narcissism is just a, a wounded child. That That's all it is. Mm -hmm. I think it's, it's you know, it's, it's, it's a really good point because, you know, I'll, I, th I think you know, going through that kind of things, you, you either tend to go two ways. You either try to work on yourself um, and sort of understand exactly what that is and, you know, whether it's something that's actually valid against against your person or whether it's something to discard. Um, and going through life sort of being dismissed because of the way that your brain is, the way that you operate and perceive things, you kind of get used to the fact that people are going to treat you negatively and it's you sort of build up this this wall you you learn from you learn how to interact with people through these negative interactions um and i think a really important sort of step in my life was realizing that hey maybe this experience in teenagehood this isn't representative of the entire human race <laughs> which yeah. sounds funny me saying this but if you have been surrounded by these experiences and not really feeling like you fit in you have this sort of warped view of what people are generally like um and so the the first step to me um you know realizing that i had these quite quite negative and defensive sort of personality traits uh was because i had a, a bias towards negative experiences negative social experiences and the point at which i was like hmm i don't know about this but let me gather some more data that's when i started to <laughs> talk to more people i started to actually like yeah exactly <laughs> i've got to approach it in the um the logical fashion um but i tell no, you something. I, I found i found some some assholes as as I, as I expected, some people like people that I was with at school. Um, but then also I found people like me. I also found the autistic community. I found, um, 
people who were just genuinely nice, lovely people who wanted the drama free, happy kind of friendship connection, emotional um, connection that I really wanted. And if, if I wasn't able to look inside myself and notice that there was this bias, um, I wouldn't be able to do it. And I, people come up, you know, people say a lot like, I hate neurotypicals. Like, why? Why do you hate neurotypicals? And it's it's usually because of that bias. They, they have such a bias and they build up these walls and these walls protect them. And they've, they've, they, they act and they um, convince us that everyone's out to get us and that we're always a step away from having a hurtful comment or um, abuse or um, negative experiences. And really, we just need those. We need to balance out that bias with, with reality. I tell you what, two of the biggest challenges I've faced in my life because of my autism. So the, t- the two that I would say were, the first thing is, is that as neurodiverse people, we have this sort of obsession to um, justice and fairness and truth in particular, that thing, truth. And I think looking back, had I have not held on to my principles as much and probably just let maybe some things go, I probably could have had an easier life. But it's I think it's an experience that's common to a lot of us. If something's not fair, like yeah. we, we, we will hold on to it forever until yeah. death. Um, and I think the, the biggest problem, the biggest challenge I've ever had was that as neurodiverse people, we are driven by truth and facts and evidence, mm-hmm. right? Neurotypicals are driven by emotions and perceptions. And those emotions might be totally detached from reality, but however, yes. they're, they're true for them. And that would frustrate me no end because I'm like, it's objectively true. Like I can show you, it's right there. It's in black and white. Why can't you see it? You could tell them the sky is blue and they'll still say it's green. And it was that theory of mind and just saying, okay, well, it might not be true in reality, but it's true for them. Um, for example, in, in the work that I do, people come with all sorts of preconceptions and ideas on what they think is happening or, or whatever. And I think if you just, if you use truth in an injurious way, and you just kind of smash people with it. Yeah. yeah, you might win an argument, <laughs> but you're not going to get them on side. You see this a lot in, in general media. So, so much. The like, online my spaces. Thought is like, why can't they understand that? That rule's stupid. I'm not doing it. And I'm like, yeah. yeah, but you've got to get through the next five years of school. Maybe it might be worthwhile just taking the. People used to say to me all the time when I was a kid, take the path of least resistance. I could never understand what they mean, but now <laughs> I get it. So pick your battles. Um, so, for example, people, you know, will come and they, they believe this is happening. And it's kind of, it's an art form being able to give them some facts in a way that's digestible for them and doesn't yeah. scar their, um, doesn't hurt their feelings. And they, they still be on yeah. side. They'll still trust you enough to follow the advice that you give them. Um, and I think that really is, if I, if I was to say in my profession, that is the, you know, the, the, the master skill, I would say it's that being able to communicate and win people's trusts without, yeah, yeah totally demolishing them with facts and truth. <laughs> I think that there's, there's a there's a really important point there because for for most people going through life, um, you know, their their perceptions or their their behaviors can be easily translatable to other people. Like if if they if they cry, they're feeling a certain way. If they raise their voice, they're feeling a certain way. If they change their tone, they're feeling a certain way. Um, but when when you when you different when you when you have a neurodiversity your perceptions your thoughts your feelings they're different and so in 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 some ways you know when when i was younger if someone wronged me you know perhaps they weren't actually intending to wrong me they would they just had a different idea of what was going on um and i think a really constructive thing for me was kind of going past cuz most of the time if someone if I felt someone was being disingenuous with me or they were being nasty, um, you know, and they were sort of stating things that just didn't make any sense, I would go, 
you know, you're just trying to be an arsehole and you're just being bad and goodbye and close doors and shut down. Um, whereas, you know, as, as I'm getting older and I'm understanding the differences between myself and someone who isn't autistic, um, it, it kind of kind of allowed me to to view the situation as just a, a crossed wires, like a situation where both people had good intentions, completely different conclusions were made just because of the the differences that we have. Um, and, and, and just, just realizing the ways that, you know, I, I perhaps might have been biased and towards a certain feeling or thought in that situation, especially when it's an emotional issue, um, and how they might be. And, you know, realizing the fact that, Hey, actually, I didn't know much about their experience and what they were doing and how they were thinking. And, and likewise, they didn't as well. So it was kind of it was a really sort of transformative thing for me to kind of go through and go like, oh, actually, hey, look, I'm actually getting this wrong. And, uh, and you know, bridges that I burned, people that I um, shut down, people that I, you know, went away from, I, I got back in contact. And some of them were, you know, rightfully so assholes. Um, but other people, quite a large majority of people, they just got a different interpretation of the situation they didn't understand how I sort of um, experienced life in terms of my emotions, my perceptions and my thoughts. And I didn't know how they did either. And understanding and un unpicking those strands where, where things sort of became miscommunicated is, was, was really important for me, you know, de developing a sense that, you know, actually, actually people aren't really much out to get me. I'm not, I'm not, you know, just inherently pushed to the side and ignored. It's just I didn't really have any way of explaining my point in a way that they understood it. Um, so the, you have that situation for a lot of people, especially if you don't have any autistic friends, autistic connections to kind of talk things through um, and really sort of understand those situations. Um, but, you know, bridging those gaps and understanding that life isn't the same for me as it is for them um, and trying to figure out the points at which that is, you know, the differences are and trying to find some way to relate to each other about that. That was so important um, and because I, I went from viewing everyone as hating me and I was lonely and nobody understood me to understanding, hey, there's been some issues here and it probably could have been addressed with a little bit more information from the people around me and also myself and sort of learning about it um and perhaps even them to understanding a bit more about how autistic people are and how they work and one of the best sayings i've ever heard is that uh, the map doesn't match the territory and what they mean by yes. that is that everybody has their own map their own internal map of the world mm. the way that they think it is and yes. different and different people's maps don't always match up and it's having the skills to be able to meet halfway and find common ground and i think um you're very uh, introspective and i think that's unusual a lot of people who i mean they you know they'll they'll look at their behavior and they'll make some justification for it or They'll yes. look at it in a way as that, oh, that they were wrong and I was right. You know, I think you're honest and you look back at yourself and you and you, you know, look at what you could have done better and you what you could have done worse. And life's a learning curve. It's important mm. not to beat yourself up. You just did the best you could at that time. And yeah. now you're in a different point. And mm. that's that's all right. It's just having that acceptance that, you know, we do the best we can. And I think also as well, I think it's important not to throw the baby out with the bathwater because some people do have malevolent intentions towards you. Yes. It's, absolute, it's yeah. absolutely true. And mm -hmm. it's naive not to think so. We live in a free market society where individualism and selfishness is rewarded. Mm -hmm. um, I think, you know, um, I've, I've worked all over the world and particularly last year I, w I was working... And, you know, some of the norms and the way people treat each other, I wasn't quite prepared for. It was yeah. different. 
Um, and it, and some of the things you come across, they are they can be rude, and it can be a power game. Um, so it's be, I think it's important to be able to decipher between instances where somebody may have done something unintentionally, which is ninety nine percent of the time. But then there are those instances where people do mean to it's it's a it's a power game, and in I think for autistic people, in my experience, in those instances, it's best to check out because it will have a detrimental effect on your mental health. And, you know, it's not good for us, those kind of environments. So if you feel like you're in the presence of, you know, someone that means you, um, you know, hasn't got the best intentions towards you, just check out of that. I think that's always better, in my opinion. I would agree with you. I I went the opposite way as well. I thought that everyone was great and everyone had the best intentions. And that led me into some very precarious long-term damaging situations um so it's it's really you know i I kind of had the switch pulled and i was like okay everything's not negative everyone's great Um, but also that was a really bad sort of mindset to have about it because um i you know the best results that i've had with people with life is to approach things with the best intentions and make it very clear to people why, what, what intentions I have and um, how I am and be open with them. But then if they take advantage of something, um, I try and understand it better. And if they're not amenable to also trying to understand it better, you know, what, what can you really do about that? Um, and it, and, if, and if it happens multiple times and it keeps happening multiple times, that's not miscommunication. They understand no. you've explained yourself. Um, <laughs> so it's... You are only responsible for your 50%, Thomas. And I think yeah. that yeah. you're only responsible for what you do and what you don't do. And if you've come to um, a situation with the best of intentions and you've been honest and you've not concealed anything, you've done your bit. Um, I think one thing that I've noticed... It's previously in myself, but in some of my friends who are neurodiverse, there can be a social naivety inherent with us. And we think mm-hmm. that everyone's our friend. Um, yeah. And I've seen that play out, that dynamic whereby, um, you know, I'm trying to explain to them, listen, so this, you get this, bullied. This, 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 and this is going on and you kind of can't see it. And they still refuse to, to see that. Um, and that can be tragic, tragic sometimes. So I think it's just, you know, just um, approach everything with the best of intentions. But when you're in the presence of someone that might not have reciprocate those feelings towards you, it's just knowing when to check out to safeguard your own kind of mental health. Um, I think it's all there's, there's a lot of um, mileage in that. I think I think one common theme for for our our talk is that everything's grey. <laughs> yeah, um, definitely. Um, we we like to think that we can develop this way of being way of living that's going to be applicable to every situation and really in a lot of cases it's not and it's very individual and um everyone's very different and it's it's just about yeah as you said doing your 50 percent um and and giving people giving people chances but also knowing at what point you know the things are not going to change and it's it's still going to be like that and they're aware and if you've tried to explain multiple times and really it's just about you know as you said stepping back um i realize that we've talked a lot about sort of that kind of positive and and growth and sort of i guess talking about the situations where our um you know mindset shifts um and and why it's important to shift your kind of mindset to you know, trying to trying to have a forward thinking kind of mindset of reflecting on yourself now and again. Um, when a negative situation happens, you try and you analyze it. You don't jump to a conclusion of someone's good or someone's bad, but you just take it. You take it easy and you take it slow, and you try to understand the situation as uh-huh. best that you can. You can um, sort of push forward, but um, I'm just really interested. I mean. You know, because obviously you've you've done you've had a lot of sort of success in your your af- athletic and, and workplace endeavors. Mm-hmm. Um, what what aspects do you think of of autism or 
and or ADHD have, have helped you and which things do you think have harmed you? Um, so I definitely think the areas that have helped have been um, being able to really focus on a subject area and because you know we have these special interests being able to acquire a deeper level of knowledge on that subject area because like I don't know about you but like when I when I'm into something I'll sit for like 10 hours on YouTube oh yeah learn, you just have I'll it playing in the background there is to know about it you're everything. making a cup of tea, yeah. you're making some food, you're just yeah. like... Cryptocurrency, don't worry, I'll learn everything about it in a week. <laughs> um, so I think there's that, and I think the ADHD, it's having that when when we are in a productive mode, like I'm able to produce large amounts of work very quickly. Mm-hmm. So, um, yeah, like I say, most people, they're kind of good at, a little bit good at everything, but we have a very unequal skill profile so that really ha- focusing on an area of interest and going really deep into it um, has helped me because when I think one thing I always say is that we're built for specialization over generalization and the good the, the the benefit of that is that like I say we're able to acquire vast amounts of specialist knowledge on one area but what that lends itself well to is sort of autonomy entrepreneurship consultancy and being self-reliant yes because we live in a free market society people will pay for real skills and if you can acquire that deeper level of knowledge on something um it gives you freedom because this the alternative to that is that potentially you're going to work in an organization and you're going to have to conform to the to the group norms you're going to have to conform to their working practices and you're going to have to conform to like their sort of values. It'll make you miserable. <laughs> it made me as miserable as anything. Um, and only through going through that process was I able to think, no, that's for me. Because you could, by learning a lot about it, you can set yourself up as, a, as an independent, as a specialist, and people will pay a premium for that. Hmm. The market de- decides how... Um, successful or not somebody is because ultimately that's where people will put their money um yeah. so i think that has been a benefit um, i think it's, it's hard isn't it because i think i think a lot of people i've talked to they have these really intense interests skills brilliant proficiencies even at like very young ages um but it's it's translating that into well how can i make the most out of this how can i craft my life around it um and like what you're often, doing now you're doing it now yeah well it's it's you know I, I i fill my life with things that i enjoy and i'm passionate about um but i think it's also you know worth pay, paying attention to the fact that we, we don't we really don't have the support systems in place that could, for, for everybody you know they may come from um, sort of more of a low income background you know I'm quite privileged in the fact that I've had the ability to explore my um, interests and ideals you know I, I didn't pay for my Mac my my parents bought it like quite a while ago for university not everyone gets to have that um, and some people really don't really have any options when it comes to employment um, sort of in the short term they don't really see a way to to realize that um, I think it's, it's, it's important because I mean, just thinking about the way that we, you know, if we're, if we're sort of going into like employment rather than being self-employed, I think, um, there is a very heavy emphasis on the deficit model when it comes to employment. Um, what are you bad at? <laughs> what can we, what can we, what can we improve that you, you're bad at? Um, and so they put all these adjustments in place and they're like, okay, so now it's tolerable. I can tolerate it. Great. That's, 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 that's not a brilliant way to live your life being no. tolerable of what you're doing. And I think one thing that the organization that I work for has done exceptionally well with is not having that deficit mindset and actually thinking, Hey, look, Hey, Thomas is really good at making videos and Thomas is really good at speaking and presenting 
why are we not why are we not getting involved in the areas of work that involve speaking and presenting and making videos and so yeah. they're, they're, i mean it's really hard because you know you have these job descriptions the employment sheets there um and you also have these governmental systems that are put in place um that kind of guide workplaces and when when you present something that could actually be beneficial for both you and the organization because it doesn't fit into that model they kind of dismiss it um and i think you you know i'm sure you've you've experienced things like that within employment and and if you know, you're the, unspecialized the only thing you have to trade is your labor and yeah. when you're in that scenario you are susceptible to the dictates and the whims of a corporation mm-hmm. Entrepreneurship, um, entrepreneurship is great because the free market decides whether you're good or you're not. And um, what was I going to say? I was going to say something. I got one second. Sorry, the, the free market decides who's good and who isn't, and it rewards exceptionalism and merit. And I think it lends itself much better to us. Um, like I say, you know, you know. Employers will make reasonable adjustments, but I take a, quite a conservative outlook on things. And I think that people um, can become the very best version of themselves if you remove the barriers out of the way. And, mm. you know, neurodiverse people need to realize that you're not defective. There's nothing wrong with you. You have some exceptional skills. And just if you go with them and believe in yourself, you can achieve pretty much anything. I, I can't remember any time being totally honest, when I've received, when I've had any encouragement or support, everything I've done has been off my own volition mm-hmm. and my own and my own initiative. Um, I think it's all a mindset. If you if you think you can't, you won't, and if you think you can, you probably will. Yeah, and I, I, obviously there's, there's all sorts of you know personal sort of experiences and um privileges and and things that we can have in life that kind of give us a leg up and get us started um and i think a lot of people who don't have that opportunity and don't sort of have that sort of positive outlook on themselves and their skills um they can get into like their mid-20s and they can see everyone around them getting a job moving out of their home um, all of these societal expectations and they kind of mount up on on you they kind of they push you down and like they present this massive gap between what people are expecting you to do and what you're doing um and sometimes it's just about <laughs> realizing that a lot of the stuff out there a lot of the advice a lot of the um support out there it's not geared towards us it's not it's, ge- it's geared towards everyone else and when someone says that you should you should not live with your parents because you're supposed to be an adult and you should be out at 18 and you should be working a job five days a week, getting the money in to survive. Um, <laughs> you, it, well, you're not. I mean, we have difficulties with, you know, we're disabled just by being autistic in a society that's not built for us. Um, Do you know something though, Thomas? Like, I'm going to play devil's advocate with you on that point because it's something that's really important to me. Um sure. And I've had this conversation a lot with people. I've received no privilege. If I'm from Stoke-on-Trent, it's one of the poorest wards in the country. I Mm -hmm. left school with no GCSEs. I had an undiagnosed disability. I was in brushes with the law more than once when I was younger. So I had every disadvantage that I was, uh, you know, I I was male. I'd got every disadvantage against me. Um, I'm not saying that, you know, I'm great or whatever, but I think if you've got um, a belief that you can do better and you're willing to put the work in, I don't think anything is unattainable. Sure. Um, in, but like I said before, I'm only talking from my experience. It doesn't mean it's universally true. It's just what I have found true for me. That's all. Um, yeah. And I, I, and I, I, I agree with you. I think, I think all of these 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 privileges and things that we have they shorten the time scale of things like um you know perhaps for me I want to start a podcast right okay my parents bought me a mac 
I can, I've bought a microphone. Um, someone may not have that. They might have to work for a couple of years, get enough stable income to save enough, get a stable income to earn a Mac and then get to a point, you know, and so, so they're always kind of, everyone's on like a different time scale. You can see YouTubers, people, um, celebrities out there, age 21, age 18, um, pretty much at the height of their career. And you can be like, oh my God, like I haven't even thought about which job I want to go for or, you know, or you might be the opposite and you might already have a plan set out and you might already be in motion and you might already have the resources that you need to do that. Um, so I think there's just a really, really important thing of knowing that in the long term, if you work on it slowly and you chip away at what you want to, to do, you learn totally. things, you totally. reach out to supports, that you can make it. Maybe not in the time scale that you want to, 100%. but your time will come with time just with that that grit and the delayed gratification um, and being aware that you're not living on the same time scale as your neighbor. Um, you know, that's Tom, important. Um, there's, there's loads of people who are like age, you know, age 50 who start their career um, there and they didn't do anything up until that point. And it's... I'm 40 this year. And I can honestly tell you that only in like maybe the last three to four years have I really came into my most productive and successful period mm -hmm. because you, what you said was absolutely spot on. It's about being consistent, doing the same things again over a long period of time. Mm -hmm. um, that's what I think equates to a big win. And that's what I found. It's been, I, I think all in all, I was in education for like 12 years just continually learning, 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 learning. And it's just about, uh, like I say, just having a, an idea of roughly where you want to go, setting a plan in place and then executing on that plan. I mean, I, you know, I work, I, I do, you know, it's, it is physiotherapy, but I do a lot of sort of like um, lifestyle coaching with people. Mm. And I say to a lot of them, okay, what do you want? And okay, like, well, well, I, I want this. Um, I, I want to be happy. And I go, okay, well, what does happiness look like to you? Can you be specific? And they're like, uh, no. I think you have to have a very specific idea of what you want. And then when you have that, the rest all kind of falls into place. And you have to yeah. be consistent in the way you work towards it. That's you what can't I just have found. Tr trudge on through the wilderness with no, no. direction. No. Like, you need to know where you're going, where exactly. you are, um, exactly. in order to make a. It doesn't need to be like a really highly specific, like a smart goal. You don't need to have this highly specific thing, but you could have, you know, at, at least a checklist, like a few bullet points. What, do, where do I want to be in, you know, in, in, in the future and not sort of basing that off what other people expect you to do in that time frame. It's not a race. Um, you what you no. said before, it's not a race. You're on your own time frame, And I think, Comparison can be the thief of joy sometimes because especially yeah. in this me this age of social media, we're always looking around at what everybody else is doing and then reflecting that back to ourselves. You're on your own track and you're gonna achieve it in your own time. Um and I think that's can be really um that can be really beneficial to a lot of people just to focus on yourself on what you're doing. Yeah. And I think it's it's hard, isn't it? Because that people use you know, people listen to this podcast, <laughs> listen to me and you talking about, um, you know, the, the place that we're at now. And, you know, we, we've, we think, cause, cause the only people that we really see and the only person we, we, we really hear are the people who have already met, made it to a certain point where they're happy, um, with what they're doing and they've got things established, but you, the, just by the nature of that, you don't hear from the people who are in the works, like there could be amazing people in the works right now. Nobody knows about them doing their thing, building themselves up over a long period of time. And then they get to a point and then they're successful and then people hear from them and then people um, see the, 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 the benefits of what they've sowed. Like you're not going to go up to a randomer who's at Taekwondo that you don't know nothing about and say, wow, you're so great. Even if, even if they're not, um, but you know, in the same vein, that person over time developing themselves, building, learning, they could be 
a world champion. They could be a national champion. They could be an international champion. They could be succeeding in these areas. But you never know. And it's we're only presented with those people who are kind of have everything at that point. Um, and everyone, you know, <laughs> this is a game with the time scales. Not everyone's there yet. And that's okay. Like, it's not expected for everyone to be at the peak because that's just not, it's not reasonable. Like, yeah, yeah. <laughs> you know, I tell you something, somebody um, that's had a large influence on me, and that was my, my dad. Um, he uh, he just got an MBE for his services to Taekwondo um, mm-hmm. because of everything that he's done with GB. Um, but I think people see the success over the last probably 10 years, but they don't know the story that led up to that. They don't yeah. know. Um, he started off fixing radiators before he, <laughs> he did a, this workshop in Stoke, where we're from. And I think um, he had a profound impact on uh, influence on me when I was younger. And I saw yeah. he just wasn't smarter than anybody else. wasn't you know didn't have this that, but he was a relentlessly hard worker. And he would just yeah. keep going and going and going and going. So now people see what he's done with GB and how successful they've become. But they don't see all the small challenges that he had over the years, yeah. doing different jobs, going, you know, having to win this battle, win that battle. And I think it was that sustained effort over a period of time that has led him to have the success that he has. And I think yeah. probably subconsciously when I was younger, I watched that and I thought, I'm going to do that as well. And yeah. that was a, a key factor in me doing all the things that I've done. And, you know, and have I been hugely successful? I don't know, but I think success is relative. And I look back at what I have done and I think, you know what, I'm happy with it. It's okay. Yeah. It's good enough for me. Yeah. I think, I think another great analogy is you see, you see the world champions on the first place stage. You see that picture. That's all you see of them. You don't see them having really bad days going, doing really badly at training. Um, <laughs> waking up at 5 a.m. And, and doing all these things and just putting in their whole heart and soul and, you know, having failures and feeling down in the dumps and feeling like <laughs> they're not going to get anywhere. You don't see that unless someone makes a movie about you. You just see that person. What? How are they doing in this competition, in this fight? Oh, they're doing well, right? So they must be just a really great person. Yeah. Yeah, but you don't see the all of the stuff before that you just see the the end result um and you know even for example with this this podcast you you hear us speaking um you hear me speaking but you don't see the person that i was five years ago who couldn't yeah. talk just to one person who just was so shy so lacking self-esteem that he just couldn't say anything because he didn't feel able to and didn't feel like he was competent enough to to speak it's you don't see that um and you don't see those small incremental changes that that i made over the of like the course of five years and the small breakthroughs and the failures and you know you've you've got to be um aware that not everything is a glory moment and that life yeah. can be boring and life can be tough and you just you just push through things and as long as you're going in the right direction and you're making those incremental wins over time um working on yourself you i know a uh, i know a, a, an mma fighter from manchester a kid who i know i know him pretty well uh, i've known him for a long time and he just won the pfl just won a million dollars um at a tournament in america he, he, you know he lives in thailand most of the time yeah. um, but i remember him from 10 12 years ago in the boxing in champs campus boxing gym when he had holes in his shoes just training relentlessly hard and now he's just you know achieving you know the the, the result of all that hard work and he's mm-hmm. getting the success but that i think that's the most uh, glaring example i can think of of someone that's just continued to work no matter what over a long period of time and now is getting his just desserts um, yeah. I think of people like that who I've known again through martial arts. It always comes back to the same thing. Yeah, and you, you've 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 also. I mean, there's there's a, there's a flip side to that, and you know, I'm not prescribing everyone to be working every day of every week, 
towards things. The, the, the fact that there is that sort of time scale doesn't mean that you have to do everything now, but it does mean that you have to do some things mm-hmm. now. Mm-hmm. Like, and it's it's not always this. Um, it's great. It's great to work and it's great to to be on the grind and to to do things. But it's it's also really important to kind of temper yourself and not get too excited because when you try to push yourself too far, when you try to push yourself too far too quickly, um, that's when you you experience those those feelings that nothing's ever going to change because yeah. you're not looking at it on a on a long time scale. You're not being patient you're not waiting for those small incremental changes over a long period of time to add up um and it's it's really important not to put that pressure on yourself just because you're not at a certain point that you want to be at this time and you know you're not putting in every ounce of everything that you have every single day um you are taking a step back you are thinking about yourself you are um, taking care of your self care and also, you know, making sure that you don't over overwork yourself and burn out. Good day, viewers and listeners. Apologies for my very rude interruption to our regularly scheduled broadcast. I just want to remind you that if you have enjoyed the podcast thus far, please make sure to rate, subscribe, like, comment, and share. All of these actions are pretty much the lifeblood of a small independent creator like myself and it will help me get most of my work more of my work to people who really need it if you want to stay up to date with my life get behind the scenes content check out my daily blogs head over to the instagram at thomas henley uk you'll find a link to that down in the description alongside my range of neurodiversity clothing just like this strong powerful artistic hoodie that i love so much And my website, of course, where you can find a contact email to book me for one-to-one autism coaching, interviews, workplace training, and speaking. So, thank you very much for listening to this very annoying self-advert, and I hope you enjoy the rest of the show. So, um, I just want to point out a little bit that um, from, from now on, uh... Oh my god! How how do I even explain it? We have had just the absolute worst luck when it comes to podcasting. Everything that goes wrong with online video calling podcasting has just all happened in this podcast. Yes. <laughs> we had like a we had like such an issue. We we're trying to set up like all our audios and mics, and I didn't have my mic turned on, and and we couldn't sort out the uh, the mic that you have. <laughs> the blind leading the blind, wasn't it? Oh my god. Yeah, so if you're noticing that it sort of the atmosphere, if you're watching on YouTube that it looks a bit darker than usual, that's that's because it is actually like an hour an hour an hour and a half later than we we had our last sort of clip. So um yeah, that's that's not brill, but um we're back again and we're gonna finish off by giving the the sort of the last talking point, last question, and we're gonna try and wrap things up. But um yeah, just 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 letting letting you have a little insider's sort of view on life as a podcaster, especially on online platforms. Um, very sorry, Nathan. This is probably not the uh, best experience of uh, podcasting so far. Don't have to be sorry. It was my fault. I came to a podcast with like no stuff set up. So <laughs> less note to self. Oh, well, okay. So I mean, we ended up talking sort of in in one of our rants kind of chatting about um life and sort of the time scale and stuff like that i guess what i want to ask is with the focus on inspiring personal growth in other autistic people um looking back on your life what changes in mindset or, or direction would have been beneficial to you during sort of your your hard times, the times when things just weren't going well? I think um, it's easier to look back with the benefit of hindsight being nearly 40. I suppose if I could give some advice to my 18-year-old, 20-year-old self, 
it would be, <clears throat> I'd have a few things really, but I think the main thing would be, um, although in the moment things can feel overwhelming and like there's nothing else that matters in the world, is to, in that moment, to take a step back and give yourself some time to gain perspective. Mm. We we often feel emotions intensely and can become overwhelmed by really intense emotions. But just by not reacting straight away and taking a step back, it allows us to see the wood from the trees. Um, so I think that I think would that's, be the first. Yeah, that, I Go think that's top. really useful. I mean, I mean, there's quite an often... Uh, there's a trap that I've got into a lot of times during my life where, you know, it's particularly when you have something that you're trying to do and it's just not working, like with <laughs> trying to sort out the Wi-Fi and the podcast and stuff, and you kind of feel that sense of time pressure and you kind of have in your head that we're going to yeah. be doing this and it's going to be finished then and then I'm going to do this and this. And sometimes life doesn't go that way and life throws you some curveballs. and um, I found myself in many situations where uh, I've been trying to work on something. Perhaps I was editing my documentary that I was trying to do and then the program kept cr crashing. Um, I kept like messing stuff up, not saving things, just absolutely going crazy. Um, I think it's important to think about like how, how anxiety works, how like adrenaline and cortisol works because it's quite like a primal mechanism that we have and it's really useful in situations that are not sort of modern day situations where you have to use your brain and figure things out and it's much more complex than running away from a lion or something like that um, but it, it anxiety cortisol and adrenaline it makes you focus in on something and um, a really big trap is is to just kind of lean into it a bit more and just keep focusing on trying to to solve the situation but you know as you're saying yeah it's it is it's right because those times where it becomes overwhelming and you feel that sort of intense drive really what the best thing to do is kind of take it take a step back and and try and regulate and relax before approaching it again um i still do it to be honest if i'm to be honest it's you know, yeah. you always, you, you have like time pressures and, you know, um, routines to kind of stick to that really regulate you. And when something goes wrong, you just, you feel this sort of rush that you have to get this done right now or everything's ruined. Like, <laughs> um, yeah, I look back at some of the things that I think have really bothered me in the past. And at the time it seemed like the world was ending, but then I look back now and I think, I don't know what I was so bothered about it really wasn't yeah. important because you know in a hundred 200 years from now none of us will be here and nobody will remember that thing so no. perspective that i think that would be the first thing um and it more of a reiteration of what i've said before because i feel like for people with autism and adhd it's almost like a cheat code and it's the really gain an understanding of yourself and who you are and focus on your strengths and specialize in those things um, because the world is constantly trying to get you to conform and just because the herd goes with something doesn't mean it's right um, mm. you find your own path and do and work in the way that suits you um, because eventually that's what will make you successful and will lead to a life of freedom and autonomy where you're not yeah. um, beholden to the you know, the societal norms. So that, that would be it. And um, strive for self-reliance, strive for independence. That's them are the things I would say. If I could tell my younger self some things, that would be it. And really, just take your time, just chill. There, there is no rush. Really important words. I think um, I really, really empathize with um, something that you said, but my brain's deleted it. Uh, Happens all the time. What was, Don't worry. What and was then as soon as we get out the podcast, you'll remember. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Exactly. Exactly. Um, yeah, I, th I think the thing about like social norms, um, you know, obviously some things that you learn from other people, they're useful. Um, some things that they aren't and they're not really applicable to you. And I think it's hard, isn't it? Because especially if you have a support network um, around you, people that sort of support you that, um, they, 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 
they have your best intentions at heart. They want you to do well. They want to help you with situations, but they don't really sort of understand how you work, how you're wired. So, you know, it it can be really hard sometimes to actually be like, hey, actually, look, I'm an adult. My brain works in this different way. I know you don't think this is a good idea, but I do, and I'm going to do this. Um, that's a really hard thing to do, especially if you're, you know, if you struggle quite a lot with the the ups and downs and lives of life and these people who support you are saying like this is a really bad idea this isn't going to work out um even if even if they're not trying to put you down they're just trying to help you sort of not fall into a trap um <clears throat> i think you know it's it's always worth taking on board what people say and try to like take your own lessons out of it but you know ultimately you are you you yourself and you know yourself and um you 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 have a different brain you work differently and sometimes the best thing is to actually just say look like this is how things are going to get done for me i'm going to do that it's worked in the past and you know i'm go- or i'm going to try this out see if this works for me and just seeing seeing what happens really because the we don't have a lot of role models out there. I didn't when I was younger. I didn't know any actually sort of openly autistic people that I could look up to to teach me about life and teach me about the ways of improving myself. So, Because if you endeavour based on following your own intuition and your own guiding sort of principles and you fail, you've got no one to blame other than yourself. What's worse mm-hmm. Is listening to always listening to the you know the, the the advice and the whims of other people that may not be accurate. It's based on their experience mm-hmm. of the world, which may or may not be accurate, and then coming up short because you will feel um, hard done by. Whereas if you kind of weigh it up, listen to your own intuitions and go with that, then win, lose, or draw, you know that you acted in the way that you wanted to. Yeah. So yeah. that would be some advice I would give: listen to your own sort of inner guidance. Um, Brilliant. and ultimately like you know a lot of, like you say there isn't many strong role models for us out there so the people that are giving you advice are quite often neurotypicals and their experience of the mm. world is totally different yeah. do you know what I mean um, so yeah that's I say to my students like when, when I used to like have a lot of students I used to say I'm going to show you my way the way I do it but it doesn't mean it's the way ultimately yeah. you'll be a thousand pieces of a thousand different people at the end of your career and you have to find your own way put your own mosaic together and i think that's really important to do that and i think it's, it's worth saying that that is incredibly daunting and scary because <laughs> you are you're the driver of it and you're also the person if it goes well you're responsible for it but also if it goes really badly you're responsible for it and um I uh, I think that's that's the hardest part of it because quite often if you if you're starting off that journey and you're trying to get follow your own sort of independent thought you will come into hurdles. Of course. And you know your dedication to following your own life journey um, is going to uh, dictate whether you take that hurdle as confirmation that you're doing the wrong thing and sort of resort back to other people's opinions. Or whether you just kind of push through or modify it a bit or change it a little bit and see what happens. Um, You're absolutely right. But conversely, although it is worrying, it's also hugely liberating because there's all these possibilities that you can do. Um, But I think you've made a really good point and you actually jogged my memory. I think one of the key things that I've learned and really important is that rejection, failure, all these are just part of the human experience, autistic or not, and you are going to experience them no matter what you do. And there's loads of cheap seats in the world of people that want to denigrate your efforts or put you down or whatever, but that's the easiest job in the world to do that. Yeah. Yeah. The credit belongs yeah, Everyone to the can person. point out your flaws, of can't course. they? But... Like you with your social media, like we were talking, you're the person putting yourself out there. You're the person making yourself vulnerable. So really those people you're not interested in their feedback. They don't get a say because you're the one doing it. And I think that's mm. really important. So um, that would be the advice I would give to my younger self. Brilliant. Brilliant. And um, 
I suppose the the last part of it is around sort of independence and self reliance. Um, I think it's definitely a good. It's good to go to go for and achieve those kind of things. Um, I am also aware that things like executive function definitely get in the way of achieving that kind of independence. It's very hard to manage every single aspect of living as an adult independently on your own. Um, it, if, if I'm to be completely honest and vulnerable, I haven't got it sorted out yet. It's not something that I feel I've got sussed out. There's areas in my life where um, I'm really good. Uh, anything work, fitness, sort of um, productivity related, I, I've got down to a T. Um, but cooking, making sure I to keep on top of, you know, sort of different sort of life needs. It's it's all works in progress. And I think, you know, what you said about sort of following your your own path is really important. Because if you if if I was to say, you know, um I don't cook. So what I do is I try to find healthy alternatives that I can use that I that I can just shove in the microwave and use. And people go, oh well, well, why don't you just cook it? It's cheaper. It's like, well, I have needs and I can't always meet those needs. And it's usually cases either that or I just don't eat. Um, so I, I think it's important to, to weigh things and not to focus generally on things. You want to be specific about what you want to improve. Um, you know, I've just started batch cooking, um, trying to, to batch cook and, you know, I've been asking for support from my family members and they've been helping me trying to do that. So there's little things like that, that I think, you know, just, just smaller segments of the bigger picture to focus on at a time is really important. And I try not to focus on improving things more, more than one or two things within a certain time frame because if you try to improve everything at once, you're just going to do a poor job of all of them. Mate, you're absolutely not. right. I think I think I think it's about having an honest and a, and a really brutally honest conversation with yourself. I can think back to my own career and what led me to do what I do now. And in terms of probably technical skill, in terms of ability, I could uh, pro- I I think I'm probably capable of doing most jobs in professional sport. Mm. The reality is. I don't have the capacity. I don't have the bandwidth yes. to yep. do all the politics that comes with that. And that was okay. I just had to admit that to myself. It's not a slur, but I can't do that. But I could do all this other stuff. And then mm-hmm. even in my own um, working in the physio box, like I noticed very early on that things like admin and managing multiple tasks, I just can't do them. So if I was ever going to expand my business, I know I would need a business manager. I've already identified that somebody will take up the slack and do all those menial tasks that I, one, aren't interested in doing and two, don't have the capacity to do because, you know what I mean? And that's, it's not good or bad. It just is what it is. And Mm. it's just being honest and identifying those things. Like I like the same as you, like just on a smaller level, I have a cleaner. I'm not interested in cleaning my house, but I know it needs to be cleaned. So I'd rather pay somebody to do it than do it myself. So yeah, I totally agree with you um, yeah. about that. I think I think so. there's a lot of societal pressures on many different fronts that to be considered a proper adult, you have to have all these prerequisites and you have to do all of these things. But we're, we're living in a very sort of, you know, especially in the UK, the sort of the Western world, we're living in a very sort of privileged time and you know, we're not living in a cave. We're not going out and surviving on our own. And it's, it's okay to, to lean on the systems that are in place. And it's okay to make adjustments in your own life. You know, we talk about a lot about workplace adjustments. What about the adjustments that we make for ourselves? Like, yes, great one. I heard from one of the advocates on Instagram, autistic Callum, he gets a taxi every morning to work, costs him probably about 10 times more than it would do to get a bus but the amount of energy and the amount of stress uh, that he avoids um, yes the amount of energy drain that he avoids from getting that taxi allows him to do so much better in the work environment which you know 
life is full of those kind of things. And I think, you know, a lot of people would probably say to, to Callum in that situation, just get a bus, like just suck it up. It'll be much cheaper in the long run. Just go and do it. And this, that, and the other. Um, but actually, no, it, it, it helps him. Why not? It's I'll tell just you what not was a big one for me. Just, um, uh, d- you know, doing uh, the job that I do, you meet people from all different walks of life. And um, a couple of my clients are, they're not like overly religious, but they're religious to some degree. And they have a period of the week where mm. from sundown on this day until sundown on this day, no work happens. And I said, you know, yeah. why do you do that? And he said, because that's time for family where it can recharge so that we can come back on Sunday or Monday and we're ready to hit the ball, you, you know, hit the ground running. And that's and a life thought, adjustment, isn't it? It's, it's like, a life adjustment. And I thought, well, we struggle with burnout. So why can't I, I do that as an autistic person? And now like Saturday night to a certain point or Sunday, I don't interact. It makes it difficult to manage relationships per se, mm, you mm. know, but I know, if, I don't know about you, but I really need that time to not oh, yeah. work and just yeah. to just like recharge so then Monday I can go back and I'm okay. Um, making those little adjustments and just recognizing that. That's, that's you know, advocating for your own needs. And I think um, you, you will come up in situations where people put you down for things or make fun of you or just, you know, give you some comments about how you should be living your life. But ultimately you are in control of it and it's completely reasonable and okay to take a little bit longer to develop certain skills but do really well in others uh, rather than just have a sort of general you know all bases kind of covered mentality to it because yeah it tends not to work that way for us and i think um yeah it's it's very hard to advocate for yourself especially to people that you care about and love and they care about and love you is you know you can, they don't understand can always, do they? Like, no. For example, taking time out, they're like, "Well, why? Like, well, I want to, I want to talk." And like, but mm. we need that time to recharge. And if we yeah. don't take that time, we can't show up as our best selves in those relationships. So it's having the balance, yeah. like you said, it's having the balance. It's important. Mm. The set points very different person to person for different multifaceted parts of our life. So, yeah, definitely. Um, brilliant. Well, thank you very much for those sort of, um, points. I think, I think it's been a really, really productive podcast and really thankful for everyone who's stuck by and listened. I know that, you know, feeling motivated and feel sort of pushed down by social norms and society can be very exhausting and ad- trying to advocate for what, for why you are living your life a certain way can also be really hard. Um, but I feel like we've covered a lot within this podcast and I think there's a lot to take away in terms of feeling okay about where you are, living by your own sort of time scale, um, staying positive, trying to grow, um, so many things. And thank you. Thank you, Nathan, for kind of bringing these, bringing these to the table. I really enjoyed well, it. Well, um, where can, where can people find you? Um, so I've got a recently set up YouTube channel. Um, I think it's at the physiobox LT. Uh, I'm on Instagram. My website has got a lot of information on there, regular blog posts, etc., etc. That's um, www.thephysiobox.net. Um, and yeah, I'm available for private consultations or online coaching, whatever. Just make contact um, on it by any of those channels, really. Cool. Cool. And I will put those links uh, down in the description as per usual. And um, yeah, if you, if you got to this point, you found some use in it, maybe it's inspired you, maybe it's helped you feel um, a bit better in this very harsh society that we live in, uh, please make sure to give me a rate if you're on Spotify and Apple. Uh, really does help out a lot, even if it's just a star rating. Um, and also, if you are listening on watching on youtube make sure to give a subscribe and a like um and if you want to sort of further this message and help it get out get it out to more people um any shares anything like that is absolutely like the lifeblood of a small independent creator like myself so much appreciated 
And of course, if you want to get in contact, if you want to stay up to date with my life, uh, you can follow my Instagram at Thomas Henley UK. Got daily blogs content on there uh, that goes far beyond sort of the podcast in different ways. Um, I think, you know, um, I think there's a lot of information over on there if you if you haven't already followed. Um, last thing is the coaching and the website. Um, if you want to head over to my website, you can get in contact with me for things like one-to-one coaching, which will hopefully be set up soon. I'm trying to set up my business at the moment, go for all the paperwork, which is um, <laughs> it's the less fun part of it, but very much needed. Um, so that, sh- that should be up at some point this year. Um, and if you want to book me for public speaking, if you want to book me for a podcast, if you just want to get in touch and say that you've enjoyed the episode and you found it useful, um, follow the contact link on my website, thomashenley.co.uk, and you will be able to find all the things that you need. And with that, uh, Nathan, thank you for, for coming on the podcast. Have you enjoyed your 40 audio experience other than the Very technical much issues? enjoyed it, yeah. Um, <laughs> we went off on a few tangents, but that was expected. <laughs> yeah. Uh, <laughs> Yeah, I really enjoyed it. And I always love listening to your podcasts. I think oh, um, thank you. you put in, yeah, no worries. You put in really useful information out there into the space to help people with ADHD and autism. So thank you for doing that. No worries. Um, I want to end up by uh, giving a nod to the fact that I haven't uh, done the song of the day for a long time now. Um, so Nathan, what what is your your song of the day what's what's a song that really means something to you that you want to share with with people i'm gonna go with uh Evalon by foo fighters because i like the foo fighters and they were one of the first bands i ever saw in concert um so that's my pick of the day very cool very cool so um i hope you have enjoyed this episode of the 40 40 podcast like share comment do rate do all that stuff and i'll see you in another episode um by me see you later guys (laughs) bye